Hey there, I'm Valerie Ling and I'm a clinical psychologist and I will be your host for season two's episodes titled the Ministry Kids Wellbeing Down Under episodes. We asked 100 ministry kids how they are doing. These are Australian kids who are either serving with their family locally or serving abroad on the field. If you haven't already done so, I recommend catching up on episode one, where I share the main findings from our survey. Every episode, I'll talk to someone whom I hope will be able to help us understand and unpack what the kids told us. I hope you enjoy it. Let's do it. Well, hello, Barnabas. I'm Valerie. It's nice to meet you. It's really nice to meet you. Um, it's it's an incredible connection uh, from me buying your book reading it a couple of years ago actually and having the seed planted to go this is really important people need to know about this stuff so so great to actually have you chatting with me yeah i was uh, i had a chance to look through the research that that you guys had done and was really uh impressed but also just blown away by the similarities between what i wrote i mean i wrote that book i guess it's been over 10 years ago now and uh and and then what you were finding and you know i obviously corresponded almost entirely with um people in the united states and you were largely people in australia but, yep. but scattered around some and yeah this the similarities were so were so remarkable to me i i couldn't believe it. i mean and i think what you've just said there you wrote this book 10 years ago um and this is you interviewing a bunch of i'm assuming adults who were were kids but these are adult perspectives in your it book. Was, it was a whole range. So, I mean, obviously a lot of it was drawn on my experience having grown up as a pastor's kid, but then I, uh, at the time I wrote it, social media was kind of fledgling. I basically just put out a link to, I think it was a Google form, something like that. And I just said, Hey, I would love to hear from anybody who's a pastor's kid, if you'd be willing to to fill out this. And it was a, it was a non-scientific survey, just sort of me posing questions, yeah. essentially wanting to find out, am I crazy? Is my experience normative or yeah. does it sit way outside the norm? And I think I had 40 or 50 people respond and they they were as young as 17 or 18 and then as old as, you know, people in their in their 60s or 70s who had grown up as, as pastor's kids. So some who were in the thick of it and others who had who had moved yeah. out of that years prior. So Barnabas, I guess we can scientifically conclude that these findings are timeless and <laughs> <It's> not so... <laughs> geographically constrained. <laughs> so it would seem. <laughs> um, but before we jump into it, I'd love to just to get to know you a little bit, Barnabas. So um, what do you do when you're not doing the ministry thing? <laughs> when I'm not doing the ministry thing, um, I have a wife and three kids. And so that is where the majority of my time and enjoyment goes. Um, so I've, I have two older daughters who are teenagers from my first marriage, and then uh, I got remarried several years ago, and we just had a son a few months ago. So we are we have a child in college and a child in diapers, and that is oh. quite a, uh, that, that's what I spend the majority of my time doing is talking to one on the phone about college challenges and the other one, you know, cleaning up messes and things like that, but both of which I, I thoroughly enjoy. It's, it's really joyful. Um, we live in the Nashville area, Nashville, Tennessee, and so... It's a beautiful place to enjoy being outside. There's a lot of wonderful live music and we just, we enjoy the city and, and getting out obviously with a little one, we do that less than we did several months ago, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a largely family oriented life right now. Do you have a lot of fun Barnabas? I sure, I try to, I, uh, one of the things that I, that I came to a conviction of while writing the pastor's kid and other things was that uh, a lot of pastors aren't very good at having fun with their families and sort of being the the head fun maker. So I, I love humor. I love fun. I love to, you know, my, laughing with my family is one of the, the best things in life, but also with friends and just sort of, yeah, just turning things into lighthearted fun if we can. So yeah, we do our best and we have a good time. Now, it doesn't seem to have frightened you from bringing your own kids into ministry. You wrote the book, you lived the life. <laughs> uh, it, it terrified me. Uh, I, I, ac I kind of accidentally ended up in ministry. It certainly wasn't my, it wasn't my intended plan. So I actually, when I got out of college, I went into the publishing industry for um, about 13 or 14 years. And that's when I wrote The Pastor's Kid. So I was writing it as somebody who did not intend to go into vocational ministry. 
Um, it was Christian publishing, so it was it was kind of in support of the church, but not serving at a church. And then um, about six years ago, the Lord and his great sense of humor rearranged things and moved my heart and moved the church that I was attending to call me as one of the pastors there. And so it was actually a point of of real serious consideration for me. What will the effect be on my two daughters uh, at that point? Because they were um, late elementary, middle school age. And and I, I remembered those days really vividly and remembered a lot of the good things. They loved our church. Uh, I love the church I grew up in, but also a lot of the challenges. And I thought is, so I had conversations with them. I had conversations with the other pastors who were, who were already serving. How is this affecting your family? And prayed a lot about it. And uh, so, yeah, it, it very strongly affected me. It didn't deter me in the end because it, it's, it was, it was clearly the right move. Yeah. And, and our church has been so kind to us and to the other pastors' families They they, they treat us well, but I still have conversations with my kids where they experience m- many of the same things that I did just in terms of the the felt pressure, the felt observation, people knowing who you are because of who your your parent and ministry is and so forth. I guess this will be an interesting conversation because you wrote the book 10 years ago and now you're actually living it with your own kids. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think there's anything that you have done differently with your kids as a as a result of maybe talking to other ministry kids, reflecting on your own experience, and then now parenting your kids? I think definitely there are things, there are things that I very conscientiously do differently, certainly than how I was raised, but also than I might have otherwise. And I think the the primary one is regular, not often, but regularly checking in with my kids with real specific questions about what what are you experiencing at church and mm. trying to let them know that I understand that um that this the, the conversation with me is a safe space to be frustrated so if they if they feel under pressure they can talk to me about that mm. um i had a funny conversation with with one of my daughters at one point because in in her adolescence, she was fully fully teenager, and she just looked at me and said, "There's no way you could understand what it's like to be a pastor's kid." And I, I tried really hard not to laugh yeah. out loud. Um, I, I don't know if I succeeded, but mm. I I smugly went and took a book off my shelf and tossed <laughs> it to her and said, "Yeah, I can. I I very much understand. This is for you." I mean, and then and then we had a really fruitful conversation where I said, "No, I legitimately wrote this for people like you, yeah. people in your yeah, shoes." Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I do pastor, I think I pastor differently and I certainly parent differently, um, Mm -hmm. because of what I experienced growing up. And I want to be clear, what I experienced growing up wasn't, uh, you know, terrible and traumatizing. There was just some really difficult aspects of it as it pertains to faith and relationship with the church, both of which I wanted to make easier for my kids. You've just given me one idea. Um, it's actually not a bad idea with some of you have the older kids for parents in ministry to actually read the book with their kids. It's probably quite a great idea because it's kind of using your words, your experience, but kids can relate to say, yeah, that mm-hmm. sounds like me or not in, in, a, in quite a non-threatening way. So hot tip just already right <laughs> off the bat, read the book with your kids. <laughs> I've, I've heard I've heard from a couple of pastors, a few over the years who have done that with their, especially their adolescent kids. And, and you know, the ones I hear from are the ones who are nice enough to reach out and say this, this mm-hmm. helped stir up fruitful conversations. So it is a thing that when, when a pastor has the, I guess, courage, because it does kind of open you up for evaluation by your kids, which is a little bit frightening. Um, it, I think it has been helpful for people. So I, I hope so anyway. So Barnabas, we managed to connect over time zones, over social media, <laughs> over really being strangers. Um, I'm I myself am curious, why did you say yes to this podcast? I said yes to this podcast because uh, the way you presented it was was so clear in terms of the research that you'd been doing and the the well being of clergy families, uh, pastors' families, which is a thing that is not the primary focus of my overall ministry. I serve at a local church, but it is a thing I care about. And it's a thing that I've, because I wrote this book, I've had um, kind of a hand in to a degree for, for a decade now. And, uh, and the other piece of it was that what I saw was um, 
you weren't just evaluating, you were seeking to build up. It mm -hmm. might, the, the, the clear impression that I got was you're, you're working for the good of families and the good of the church, which seemed wonderful to me. And that, that seemed like the kind of thing that I would, I'd be thrilled to, to participate in, in whatever way I could. Well, I, I'm genuinely encouraged um, by what you've just said. And I think that is our hope that, um, I, I mean, I have two of my kids who, through the survey results and making sense of their own experiences, evaluating our parenting <laughs> is frightening. But, you know, Barnabas, I think I often say to parents, it's not about the rupture. It's not about the mistakes that we make. It's always in the repair it's mm -hmm. always in going, oh, I finally get it. Oh, this is what you're you've been trying to say to us. And, and I think equally to the church, because it's it's God's given gift to us to have fellowship and belonging and community. We're not meant to do this alone. And if we can all get on the same page and see that, you know, we really want the same thing. And here's a couple of really unique things that ministry families and kids experience. And if you can get that, um, you know, I think we're, we're, we're a step ahead of, of, of where we were before. So I really appreciate you jumping on this call. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> One thing I want to get out of the way is that you obviously come from um, a, a famous public family, but I'm thinking social media and the internet was not, was it around for all of your childhood? It wasn't around for much of my childhood at all. It was no. uh, social media really wasn't until I was an adult. Yeah. Um, I'm 41 now. So, and then, uh, and then the internet and sort of the rise of how, how videos made people famous and could be shared. Mm -hmm. That was more during my, my early twenties and college years. So while I accept that you've had an experience that is in and of itself unique, um, one of my hypotheses, and I'm curious to see what you think about this is in an age now where just about every minister has their sermons on YouTube, um, people can screenshot their things. Um, there's Facebook conversations about their ministry. In some ways, I think ministry kids in this day and age have got to live with kind of a public profile in their parents' ministry. What are your thoughts on that? That's, yeah, I think that's absolutely true. I think, you know, it's what I experienced, you know, being the son of of John Piper, and he came to, you know, real evangelical prominence in the late 90s, early 2000s. So I was a teenager and then heading into to my college years. What I discovered as I as I've talked to other pastors kids is that my experience wasn't different than theirs. It was just bigger. So there's mm -hmm. there's sort of a scalability to so if, if I felt very much under pressure by being a pastor's kid of a well-known person, they felt the same way, just in a smaller context. So it's, you know, whether it's a hundred people or a thousand people or a hundred thousand people, it's it's generally the same experience to size. And and I I suspect that the same thing is true uh for the the public online persona uh or or, or prominent ministries of pastors and how that affects kids. The there is a difference in that the internet is a meaner place and it is a less human place. Mm. There's a lot more opportunity for people to anonymously be awful. That does, you know, I didn't experience that growing up because if you were going to be awful to me, you kind of had to come do it to my face. And most people don't have the courage to do that. So mm. um, I think if there are criticisms and things like that, it's it it might be that that side of things might be exacerbated by social media, the internet age. Thinking of of you know if a pastor makes a controversial statement that goes viral, and his kids log on to their social media and they just see the the comments upon comments or the resharing with vitriolic statements, that's mm -hmm. that's uniquely hurtful. And I I have had to see that about my dad, but I didn't have to see it growing up. I kind of grew into that as an adult, which means I had maybe a little bit more. Uh, capacity to to handle it, hopefully with wisdom, patience, thick skin, something. Mm. Well, I'd love to, what I was hoping for this episode with you, Barnabas, is um, really to engage your lived experience. And by taking a bit of a walk around the book, mm -hmm. um, particularly with, I think, the issues of identity and coming up with independence in faith and 
you know, being able to grow in a Christian community when you're a ministry kid, not being the outsider, but very much still um, benefiting from Christian fellowship. How's that sound to you? Sounds great. Um, so the book is The Pastor's Kid, written by Barnabas Piper. And I'm going to just ask you, um, well, actually, before I do that, was there anything from our survey results that really jumped out at you that you might want to talk about? I think the biggest thing was that nothing has changed in mm. 10 or 12 years. So I, you know, the book came out 10 years ago. So I was doing my own sort of low key research 11 or 12 years ago. And <clears throat> the summarized results of what you guys found were so similar to what I found in and and what has remained true in conversations with people over the years. I think one of the the, the staying power of this conversation, I think, is surprising to me because almost everything else in the church uh, is cyclical, and it and it it is, uh, and it kind of goes in maybe seven seven to ten year cycles. And so, if it's if there's a, something that's really popular now, it won't be in five or seven or eight years. Mm. But this seems to be an ongoing lived experience of pastors' kids. I do think churches are getting better at mm. caring for pastors' mm -hmm. families. I think there's more conscientiousness about it now, which is fantastic. But the results said there's a lot of similarities. So that I think that was probably the most surprising thing is that I would have expected more difference. And instead it was this, this continues. If, if you were, well, if you were thinking that there could be some differences, what might've been some of the things that you thought would have made the differences? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know that I thought about it that deeply as much as just things change, you know, the church mm -hmm. changes. Um, but I do think, I think one of the things that I would have expected as a as a potential cause for change is that there was a time when pastors were put very much on a pedestal in mm. in almost every yeah, evangelical church culture, um, and it didn't matter like ethnicity, it didn't matter church size, it didn't matter denomination. Pastors were were prominent figures. I think that has changed in the church. And there are a lot of churches where um, the pastor is in some healthy ways and then in some unhealthy ways less respected than he used to be, which you would think maybe would take some of the pressure off of the pastor's family mm -hmm. um, because because they're less uh, they're less kind of pedestaled. But my hypothesis would be that they're still as public as they ever have been. They're just not as um, kind of the poster boy, if you will. Yeah, I think the number one, because I, I looked at the results again today, um, just from a different angle, and I think you can see that it is the busyness of ministry, um, yeah. there's higher expectations of output as well, and we're probably a lot more switched on, um, you know, the digital age just means that you, you, you're you tempted or expected to um, continue to read text messages or WhatsApps or yeah. Facebook and emails. Um, but also, I think it's the age of loneliness. So, you know, our, mm. our survey results um, suggested that about half the kids were struggling with some levels of loneliness, but that is across yeah. society. So we're probably a lot more disconnected from one another as well. So I think maybe those changes um, in church life are true, but they don't necessarily mean they've brought more relief. In fact, I think it's probably complicated the picture a bit more. <clears throat> As a, I mean, as a pastor, I, I haven't even thought about that with in, in terms of talking to my kids about those specific aspects. But as a pastor, I can say that that's true. Comparing my experience yeah. now as as one of the pastors at a pretty decent sized church yeah. to my my dad's experience, he, you know, we had a home phone and uh, and you know <laughs> we got letter we got letters in the mailbox and so. <laughs> Co yep. correspondent correspondence yeah. with him or reaching out to him yeah. had very specific and not always available channels. And I remember him telling me, uh, unless it's an emergency, tell them I'm not available. So I, you know, I answer the phone, hello, it's the Piper residence. And, and I would just decline calls basically. I'm sorry, he's unavailable right now. Can I take a message for him kind of yeah. thing? And, yeah. and that's not possible when your phone buzzes in your pocket while you are with your family um, so that that has definitely uh, muddied the waters of of boundaries and accessibility, and then and then bleeding into busyness. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we're just gonna walk around your book now. 
chapter one, what's wrong with that boy? You know, the thing that struck me about that chapter, boom, from the first chapter, it was, you know, you talk about how you didn't have any relief even in the car park or if you went to the supermarket or at school or the toilet. These are all unseen spaces for mm-hmm. a ministry kid to be judged. Um, for you, how did you find relief from that? Hmm. Um, I, there, there was, there was a, there was a couple different ways. Uh, one of them was that my parents did a very good job of not putting additional pressure on us kids because we were the pastor's family. I have no recollections of my mother, for example, doing something like we're on our way to church and her saying, you better behave because we are the pastor's family. There was, there was, it was always understood that I was to behave because that's the right Christian standard for a kid. You, 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 you obey your parents. So, so that there there was relief in that way. Cause I didn't, I didn't feel like I was getting it at home at, on that pressured front. Um, the other way was that in God's kindness, I have always had a small number of close friends who I could just be my unfiltered self with, which is not always great. You know, my unfiltered self, especially as a kid could be pretty out of control, but, uh, but they didn't, I never got judgment from them for acting out of bounds in the pastor's kid way. And so those, those close friendships were, were a sweet relief, even if it was an outlet that I was, I was, I was acting the fool in and, 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 you know, being dumb. Um, there was still, there was still a relief of just in these spaces, in these friends' houses, when we're playing video games in their basement or playing basketball or whatever it is, we're just kids. We're just having fun. We're just cutting up and being silly and whatever else. And, uh, and that those, those in retrospect are maybe even more dear to me than they were at the time. And I loved them at the time. So does it kind of like, for me, that sounds to me that your parents giving you that acceptance and space to be a regular kid helps then in those instances when other people might have different expectations of you? Does it kind of their view of you has more weight and helps to overcome that. But would you have been able to go up to your parents and say, hey, you know, um, I'm having a rough time, like, you know, in the car park, someone said that I was dressed weird and I should change or the music that I'm listening to. Would that have been an easy conversation to have? No, it wouldn't have. And and that's, I will say one, one thing that is, that was very difficult at the time, but has been kind of a sweet change over the years my parents were not they did i don't even think they were aware of the kind of pressure that that we were under i think maybe in a general way we being me and my siblings um maybe in a general way that 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 there's an additional pressure but i don't think they kind of recognized the the specificity of it or how constant it was um mm-hmm. and so they never they never cracked the door open to have those conversations when i was younger mm-hmm. We have had really good conversations over the last, I'd say, 10 years. So in adulthood, yeah. and they have talked about how if they could go back and do some things differently, they recognize things now that they didn't recognize at the time. So there's been this this sweet ongoing change, which is wonderful because it means they're still investing in being good parents and and the relationship can get better. But at the time, I don't think I would have even known how to go yeah. to them um, and so there was both not an instinct to do that. And also I, I don't know that. Yeah. I think, I think I would have just, I don't know that I would have known how to articulate it. I think a lot yeah. of the pressure that I felt was something that I learned how to articulate yeah. later, not yeah. in the moment as a 12 year old or a 14 year old yeah. or something like that. You're actually reminding me of one of the comments in the survey says, I wish I could say things better to my parents. Um, now, I don't expect you to have the magic answer to this, but with your <laughs> own kids, what have you attempted and, and what seems to be working so that maybe we can get some wisdom to know, okay, let's try this with our kids. Yeah, I, because I have learned over the years how to articulate the things that I felt when I was mm-hmm. a, a child and an adolescent. Mm-hmm. Um, I just try to pose questions pertaining to those specific things to my kids now. Yeah. Um, you know, questions like, do you ever feel like somebody holds you to a, a higher standard? Mm-hmm. Um, and 
And and the answers vary. You know, at at certain periods of time, they shrug and they're like, "No, I'm fine. Everything's good." And sometimes they're like, "Ah, yeah, it's really frustrating." And then there's usually some venting, and then hopefully a fruitful conversations, uh, fruitful conversation. I, I, I talk to them about the necessity of coming into their own faith. I don't even know if they know what I mean by that, but what I want them to hear is, "You don't need to parrot me." And it's okay to have questions, yeah. you know? So if there are things that, that you are struggling, to, that you read in the Bible and you go, I don't really get this. That's okay. You're not obliged to get that because you're a pastor's kid. You're not obliged to accept that because you're a pastor's kid. Yeah. If we're accepting that it's because we, we are, we are having belief in the God who wrote it. And so we, we want, I want them to have the, 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 the freedom to come to a faith in Christ that, that is that they articulate in their terms and on their timing. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's that checking in behavior. So they could mm -hmm. use your book, they could use the results of our survey go, there are some universal truths now that have been established over the decades yeah. and across continents that some ministry kids might experience this. What's that like for you? Right. Um, and that checking in behavior, just keeping that consistent and constant, you know, eventually you might get an answer, but I guess it shows that as parents, we're, we're, we're they're important, aren't they? We're, we're checking into their experience. One, and one thing that I've observed with my kids, and I think this was true of me, but again, I didn't have the outlet was there are times they get angsty and frustrated mm. and maybe are not. And if I just said, what's wrong, it might not they might not be able to to put it into words but if i say hey is there something is there something that happened at church that's frustrating you is there like a, a group of people who have you know yeah. kind of made you feel under pressure or whatever it is they, yeah. that will often lead to maybe not immediately in the moment but lead to a kind of an unearthing of what it is that's that's causing them to feel angsty because they feel like they're being asked to be a hypocrite or they're feeling judged or 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 and it and it can kind of draw some of that out. So even just having the 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 awareness and the research that you've done give some great categories to pastors on things to ask about. Yeah. You can draw out some of that that angst that might not be readily uh, articulated. Yeah. Um <laughs>